And I came in there in 1955 <coughs> as one of his mass production, production writers. And they encouraged this, so I thought this works very well for him, for me. And so I, I was one of the few who never went to work for him because from I was you still didn't need no I was still in college in 1955 and I was selling a story a week. He was saying he had, somebody would call up a guy named uh, Larry Jennifer would call up. Uh, he later became Larry Harris. No, he said he was Larry Harris. He became and he became Larry Jennifer Harris. later. Everybody changed his name at Scott Meredith, including Scott Meredith. Well, you know. Scott, as you said, was started off as Sydney, and he took the name Scott Meredith when he opened the agency, and he hired his brother, whose name we're not certain what it was, but his brother he had become Sydney Meredith, <laughs> so that if someone met him and said, "Aren't you Sydney?" he could say, "No, that's my brother." <laughs> and then many years later, Sid Sid retired, like. Sid retired. Yes. Sid retired and he went to Florida and he didn't like it and he came back and he had lunch with Scott. And he said, You know, I'm sick of being retired. I want to go back into business. That's true. And uh, and Scott said, Well, what business are you going gonna go into? And Sid, who'd always been the office manager and the beside behind the behind the scenes guy, said I think I'm going to go into business as a literary agent. <laughs> Scott oh. said, well, you can do that if you want, he said. But if you use the Meredith name, I'll sue you. <laughs> <laughs> so the son of a bitch gave his brother a name and wouldn't let him use it. <laughs> when I didn't know Sydney retired, I had moved to California by then. Who did Scott go to the bathroom with? <laughs> They, the brothers always went to the washroom together. Yeah. And um, also, Sid was very useful because when someone wanted something from Scott, like an advance or, a, or, or anything of that sort, he would say, Let, wait a minute, I'll check with Sid. And then he would go around the corner, wind his watch, come back and say, I'm sorry, Sid says no. <laughs> Um, he was my agent for 27 years. Yeah. And, uh, I have no complaints about Scott. He treated me well. I treated him well. Yeah. And then I left. Got a different agent. And he got very angry. Mm -hmm. Oh, bad. He felt there was a betrayal that after 27 years I would go away. How come you left? I had stopped writing for a while. I was in my 40s doing what happens to people in their 40s, so I, I stopped. When I came back, I thought, it's time to quit this mass production stuff, get a different agent. And I met my own different agent, Stephen King's agent. And uh, I told Scott, not you are the kind of agent who encourages a writer to write as fast as he can, regardless of consequences. No, I said. I'm having a midlife crisis, Scott, and I'm changing everything, and one of the things I'm changing is my agent, which is almost the truth, but not really. Yeah. And he, he was famous for retaining his rights to everything he wrote. He was so angry at me, he just threw it all back at me and said, all right, take everything, which was fine. Was yeah. <laughs> it was not a good agent. But he was the right agent for me to be the kid that I was. Yeah, for, for what agent. you were going to be writing. Yeah. And, anyway, and, and that and writing that way. You know, I've looked uh, back, and I <coughs> we both uh, wrote oh, mid-century erotica is the name I've decided I prefer for, <laughs> for the John. I feel like when when someone describes the early books, I find this erotica. I thought that's wonderful. I, I really like that. And I felt like that character in Moliere, Prose. the Frenchman, who all his life, uh, discovered at one point that all his life he'd been speaking prose. <laughs> he hadn't known that, and he felt really good about himself. You know, and I, I felt that way about that. And I, I wrote 
that because it was it was easy and it, it came naturally to me and I was like 18, 19 at the time when I, I started doing this so I and I was writing about you know or I was writing erotica so I, it really flew in the face of write about what you know <laughs> I must admit that uh, but uh, and I think I stayed too long at the fair you know it was a it was a good apprenticeship but there was a time to stop and I probably went on a little longer than I, I should have but uh, you know that was never the agency that was going to encourage you to take chances and extend yourself and take a little more time and do a little better book. You know, I was the writer who brought the erotica to the agency. Uh -huh. um, a friend of mine named Harlan Ellison went to work for the publisher out in Chicago, uh, Bill Hamling, mm -hmm. and I had been writing a few of these things. Uh, we didn't call them erotica then. I didn't know I was writing erotica either. We called them sex novels. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the theory was that you found two protagonists of opposite sex. You got them into a conflict-laden situation. And you kept them jumping in and out of bed for 220 pages or so. And passed go and got $1,000. A thousand dollars back then was ten or 15000 in today's purchasing power. Yeah, I guess so. And if you could knock out one of those a week, you got rich. Uh, that was I didn't do as many as you. Yeah. <laughs> you. You were the most extraordinarily productive writer I ever I did 150 of them. Yeah. And I did them in six days. Anyway, Harlan called me. I've been writing these. And he said, Bill, Bill was a science fiction publisher. Yeah. He said, the science fiction magazine is dying. He, he wants to do something else. What about these sex novels? Can you write one a month for us? I said, yeah, one day, six hundred dollars. How about eight? Yeah. This is bargaining. So I agreed to write one month. And I did. This is nineteen fifty-nine. And Hamley put these things out and they sold as fast as he could print them, you know. It was staggering quantities. They were marking them up in the stores on Times Square, yeah. too. They had a cover price of 50 cents, and they were selling it for 75 cents yeah. or a dollar. Yeah. Big, big money. Yeah. And then he came back to me hard and said, can you do two of them? $1,000. $2,000 a month. In 19, this is now 1960, I'm 25 yeah. years old. Yeah. And I'm making 2000 a month from this one market. I'm also writing the science fiction yeah. still. And that is 2000 a month. That's about a quarter of a million a year in today's purchasing power. Why not write them? It's stupid not to write them. And Scott said, what is this stuff you're writing? I told him. He said, can I get in on that? Sure, call Bill Hamley. <laughs> and he took over the whole thing. He sure did. And, and uh, he wound up also, you know, he only took 10% of what the writer got. But he also took uh, some sort of consultant fee, which was about equal to what the writer yeah. got per book, uh, and it, it, as a compensation for having the simplest marketing job in the world. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, of course the writers didn't know that it was double dipping. I didn't find this out until last year. Yeah, <laughs> I found it out a few years ago, but it was it was fairly recent. But I didn't care because eventually my price got up to twelve hundred a book. Yeah, that's what mine got. I wrote them in six days. Yeah. Um, Nineteen sixty-one. Uh, I bought Carol and Lidwardia's mansion in Riverdale on the proceeds of this stuff that I was writing. But Lidwardia uh, would so proud. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of reading the comics in the morning, he yeah. would. He would have yes, been that's right. <laughs> that people really would have listened. <laughs> um, but after five or six years of it, I had about enough. Yes, yeah, so I made a ton of money. And so <laughs> and, uh, then the FBI came around. The FBI ever come no. to you? No, not yet. They probably will tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>